Good afternoon, everyone in Vermont and on the line. I call this meeting for the advisory subcommittee for sustainability to order. I'm Tom Alasco. Uh, I'll take roll call for our subcommittee members, um, starting with uh, Jacob Pulitzer. Here. Is there present? Uh, Billy Coster. No, no, no problem. We're, we're still on schedule. Kim Watson. I don't know if she was planning to attend today. Okay. Okay. Uh, and Stephanie Smith. Yep. Here. Okay. And the other uh, CCB members in the room with you. Just myself, Kyle Harris, from a from a board member level. And thank Brent, you, Kyle. And Bryn's and here. Bryn is. Yep, I'm here. Bryn's here. You can scroll over to her. Oh. Do you want to be seen? <laughs> you you can. You can just say you. I'm that's, here. That's I'm here. Hi. <laughs> thank you. Oh. And then I, I have to be members of the, of the public as well. So since this is our first subcommittee meeting. Um, well, thank you again for your attendance and greetings to all of you um, that have made the effort and have the interest to attend this subcommittee meeting. Uh, and since it's the first one, I wanted to do brief and I want to emphasize the word and concept of brief because we have much to do and discuss. Brief intros for our members before moving on with our agenda and I'll be speaking very quickly uh, because of our time constraints. Again, I'm Tom Nolasco. I'm the general counsel for the National Association of Cannabis Businesses or the NACB which is a national trade organization that specializes in creating standards and best practices for the cannabis industry. Our goal is to legitimize and elevate the growing cannabis marketplace. And part of our function that we do at the NAACB is to consult with various state legislators and regulators as we are doing with this engagement. My personal background, I'm now a 20 plus year attorney, uh, specialized in commercial or business litigation. I've been in the cannabis space for about seven eight years. Uh, starting with cannabis lawsuits, partnership disputes uh, that grew to, uh, like with any good startups, uh, they have legal needs and compliance, employment, real estate issues. I served, started serving on panels for the Arizona State Bar, where I'm based out of, uh, and then panels throughout the country on issues ranging from licensing to 280E um, to social equity. And so it's my privilege and the NECB is privileged to help coordinate these various subcommittee meetings and create good policy for the state of Vermont. So before getting into introductions from our very knowledgeable and accomplished advisory subcommittee members, I wanted to introduce uh, another member that's working with the NACB uh, and a specialist in this area of sustainability, Jacob Pulitzer. Jacob? Hi, oh, yes. Uh, thank you guys, everyone, for taking the time out of your day and joining this uh, amazing sustainability subcommittee. I'm very happy to uh, be, be chairing it and, and really Honored and glad that Vermont is taking the initiative at the very beginning to make sure that sustainability, environmental uh, impacts are thought about and included into the future recreational uh, regulations. I guess a uh, brief background uh, for me. So I uh, have a background in environmental science uh, and management. I've been focusing on sustainability um, for the last probably 15 years, cannabis sustainability specifically for the last seven. Um, I'm the co-founder um, of the Cannabis Conservancy, where we created the first uh, sustainability standards and certification body for the cannabis industry. I'm also a co-founder and board chair of Sun and Earth Certified, which is a regenerative cannabis uh, certification. Uh, also uh, founding members of the City of Denver Cannabis Sustainability Working Group, uh, the National Cannabis Industry Association's uh, Cannabis uh, cultivation Committee and then their new Sustainability Council, um, as well as the co-founder of the Southern Colorado Cannabis Alliance, which seeks to bridge the cannabis industry with the, I would say, conventional ag to help solve uh, food security issues um, in a often underrepresented uh, area of Colorado. Um, and uh, probably a few other things. Um, and. Uh, 
Yeah, so mostly focusing on you know measuring and monitoring the environmental impacts of cannabis cultivation, um, as well as creating kind of national, internationally recognized uh, best practices manual. So kind of been completely immersed in the sustainability, environmental impacts of cannabis cultivation, indoor greenhouse, and outdoor. And so while we do these brief introductions, I also wanted to throw in a question if you guys could answer, um, which is really. What environmental impact is of greatest concern for you or your department agency? And I guess to answer that, I think for me, not necessarily greatest concern, but one thing I'd like to see is everyone always talks about energy, water, and waste, but I think kind of environmental or ecosystem management and services and conservation and ensuring that there is a spot for craft cannabis and small farmers, I think it's really important in the industry in general, but specifically also to the Vermont uh, market. Um, yes. So, Tom, did you want to call on someone else? Yeah. That? Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, and we'll, we'll obviously get back to you shortly. Uh, Billy Koster, if you want to uh, say hello and give a brief introduction. Sure. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Billy Koster. I'm the director of planning for the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. Um, I my work involves a number of areas primarily related to land use planning and energy siting uh, on the regulatory policy and legislative side. Um, I manage our agency's participation in Act 250, which is a state's land use law, and uh, represent the agency before uh, our Public Utility Commission on Energy Proceedings. And um, I work across our agency's three departments to coordinate on um, policy issues where we have um, you know, kind of shared interests across uh, the enterprise and work closely with other state agencies and stakeholders on land use and energy issues. So just happy to be a point person to the technical staff and regulatory programs within our agency and help uh, you know guide the work of the, the board um, to stand up the marketplace in, in a way that's environmentally sustainable and responsible and hopefully through a reliance of our existing um, book of environmental laws, uh, which in Vermont is quite robust and and hopefully not uh, seen great need to go beyond what uh, other industries already need to comply with. So happy to kind of fill gaps and uh, provide information on, on how enterprises comply with our existing environmental regulations, but hopefully not seeing uh, the need to do a ton of new work to expand uh, existing protections. So thanks for having me. Excellent, thank you, Billy. Uh, Stephanie? Smith, if you want to say hello and give a brief introduction as well. Yep. Um, so my name is Stephanie Smith, and I work for the um, Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. I currently manage the hemp program, but I have um, experience with municipal land use planning, um, state environmental permitting, um, farmland conservation, composting, <laughs> um, and various other things. Um, so I have the hemp background and a little bit of land use um, background uh, and land use permitting. But yeah. I don't have anything really additional to add. Um, I agree with Billy's sentiments about not reinventing the wheel related to some of the existing environmental permitting that exists in the state, um, but also you know, finding clarity where that needs to happen and, and again, filling gaps. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. And I still think we do not have uh, Kim Watson, but uh, maybe on Monday we'll be able to give her a chance to do uh, an introduction for herself. And then, Kyle, I understand we have um, some folks in the room uh, from the public as well. I think you said two? That is correct. Great. Um, thank you. And I, I want to make sure everyone knows that written public comments can be submitted electronically via the web form on the CC, CCB website. They have been since May 2021. I want to ensure everyone that your comments have been received, reviewed, and considered. Um, and we do appreciate your input. There will be time for public comments and questions toward the end of our hour. And in addition, the CCB will be hosting dedicated meetings for public comments at both a Friday board meeting via the public uh, link or at the CCB's public comment evenings, which will also be posted on the website. So your voice will be heard and will be considered. It's an important part of the process, but we do have some pressing deadlines upon us and it's critical we have some constructive communications between uh, ourselves, Jacob, and the board members to meet these deadlines. So I do not want the hour to be dominated by public comments. Uh, they will be, uh, there will be a time for that at the end. Uh, and again, those your public comments and input uh, can be made and addressed through the different avenues that I just mentioned. So um, 
Jacob, I'm going to let you take over uh, the enabling legislation for this with Act 62 and 164. Uh, as everyone likely knows, the tasks that were listed on there are to uh, develop regulations and standards regarding energy efficiency, groundwater considerations, solid waste, accommodations for small cultivators, uh, economic sustainability, and again, focusing on, on small cultivators. Those are some of the tasks that this subcommittee um, is is given to it. And so Jacob, I'll, I'll let you lay out. And again, this is, this is the first meeting. Um, so we're laying out kind of the scope uh, and addressing some questions and our strategic plan ahead as we develop these. Jacob? Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, real quick before jumping into the um, like the overview of subcommittee goals and outcomes, I did want to just mention that we did receive a few uh, written public comments, so I did want to, uh, to address those real quick. Um, there was one dealing with incentivizing LED lights over HPS as they do with home cultivators. Um, with the example of like a Green Mountain utility offering $200 uh, per LED light, um, they had recommended establishing a separate tier fee structure and working with all utilities. So I did want to address that and say that we'll be discussing that um, during the energy specific meetings that we have. Um, but just to mention that uh, we do want to encourage energy efficiency and in my perspective, potentially not mandating it like they did in Massachusetts which had seen the unintended consequence of utilities not offering rebates, um, at least at the beginning. Um, so we just wanted to address that. And then um, there's quite a few comments and not necessarily we're dealing with sustainability, but more with the market in general, but had to do with um, making sure that the uh, recreational uh, cannabis industry um, follows or at least honors um, pertains to the Vermont pride that you have in food to table, you know, food models, the craft beer industry, that there's a direct to consumer approach that allows farms to diversify their offerings, what I would call kind of farm gate, um, as well as, you know, ensuring that there's the ability to create kind of a craft cannabis culture um, and kind of protections against multi-state operators, which also recommended kind of the direct to consumer. So there's about three or four comments on that. And then um, lastly, uh, like, one comment on that Act 164 kind of favors indoor cultivation when cannabis are limited by square footage. I believe this commenter was referring to kind of the number of harvests you can get indoor versus outdoor. Uh, you know, outdoor are usually one. If you're doing kind of light deprivation, pulling tarps, you can get up to kind of three kind of this season extending um, harvests. So I believe that's what they were talking about. But they, you know, mentioned the capital costs um, for indoor cultivation, which essentially creates a barrier to entry uh, based on you know financial opportunities or financial um, ability. Um, and then that the indoor expenses will essentially be leaving the state and not benefiting local economies. Um, and then the large carbon footprint of indoor grows. And they recommended adding kind of a plant count in addition or in lieu of square footage. So I do wanna say that that will also be discussed as uh, get to the specific topics um, but will definitely be are going to be considered and then lastly that there is definitely um, consideration for equity and inclusion that you know core values of sustainability equity ethical responsibility will be uh, considered as we go through this process so I just want to address those written uh, comments um, yeah so then uh, moving on how I had viewed this is the first subcommittee meeting was taking kind of a macro level overview of what we want to accomplish that we're all kind of on the same page as we start to uh, really get into kind of more technical aspects of specific topics. Um, and so, I just wanna make sure I'm not skipping something real quick. Oh yeah, so looking at kind of the overview goals um, and outcomes. So my understanding is kind of Tom, I just said that we are here to provide recommendations to inform the rulemakings to the Vermont legislature. Um, my understanding is what that looks like as far as a final deliverable has not been determined yet. So that, I guess, how we, you know, decide on like what we uh, actually provide to uh, the Vermont Cannabis Control Board will be, you know, informed with us. Kyle, am I correct on that? Yeah, and Brent can correct me if I'm wrong. So the way that I, understand this process unfolding is the subcommittee will and I don't know if there's a specific format that we've determined whether it's 
a couple pages, bullet points, combination of it, whatever, whatever the subcommittee, I guess at this point, determines is the appropriate format for the board to e easily digest recommendations is probably the way to go. The board will consider um, the subcommittee's work, vote on that work if we are in favor of it, and if it meets our vision and mission statement that this inaugural board has kind of laid out in previous meetings, um, we'll, we'll vote on it. If, if we vote favorably, it'll go to the legislature. If everybody's on board, it'll be the foundation of what um, informs our, ro our rulemaking process over the, the next couple months. I think that that's correct, Brent, but correct me if I'm wrong on anything. I, I, I don't have anything to correct. I may just add that you know the, the advisory the goal of the advisory committee is to advise the board, and the board is going to submit its report to the legislature based on the guidance it received from the advisory committee. Um, and that report that goes to the legislature um, and the rules, the rulemaking process, um, will all be informed by the advisory committee's work. So, Thanks, just an addition, no correction. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so with that, you know, what I've seen from working in, you know, 10 other legalized states when it comes to these process or how the rules um, have been written and kind of unintended consequences is, is knowing that, you know, when you kind of write rules, it's almost black and white, but we live in a very gray uh, world. And so the interpretation um, and the intention, I guess, and the interpretation of, you know, the recommendations and ultimate rules, I think, plays an important role. So kind of keep that in mind um, as we start to discuss these things. Um, but I would say, uh, and I'd like to hear kind of the other subcommittee members' opinions on this, but you know, we are trying to seek to mitigate negative environmental impacts. And that, you know, the focus, uh, you know, if we do our job correctly here would be focus on outcomes and kind of balancing the aspirational versus prescriptive as far as our recommendations. Um, but kind of what is, uh, I'd love to hear Billy and Stephanie kind of what your uh, thoughts are on that as well. Uh, sure, yeah, I, I think that's a great goal to have. Um, I would just kind of temper it with the reality of time and capacity and the fact that, as I said earlier, Vermont has a very robust suite of environmental regulations to start with. I don't know if that's the case in a lot of the other states that have kind of uh, recently uh, legalized rec recreational cannabis. So I think we're starting from a very high bar already. Um, so I, I think I would just encourage you to keep that in mind. And I don't know that there's a lot of bandwidth within kind of the state government to stand up new programs or do anything additional for this sector uh, unless it's absolutely necessary to maintain kind of environmental protections. I think having like medium and longer term goals to like improve conditions is, is, is a great thing and, and should be part of any sort of new effort but I, I'm just understanding the timeline you're on just wary that you know anything new may be difficult to stand up in the short term and would encourage you to focus on where gaps exist um, or where there's unique a aspects of this industry that does need kind of special provisions or special attention or, or guidance or technical assistance um, I'm happy to be kind of persuaded otherwise, but that's kind of how I come to the conversation. Um, no, I agree. Okay. So I was just I was just thinking relative to Act 164 specifically whether or not there's a list of um, flex points related to uh, sustainability and environmental regulation with this crop. Um, is there? Are there mandates that, I mean, and, and I've looked at it, but I'd be interested from the board perspective or from others' perspective, um, and I don't have a list in front of me, so let me be clear, but what is mandated by the, the statute, well, where the flexibility exists, because if we already know we have to do something, and granted, that could be for the short term until another legislative session comes around, but we might need to uncover what that mandate is and what the problem is with it and how to change it, or it's fine the way it is, um, and or where the flex of, where those flex points are. So for instance, section five of Act 164 talks about multiple potential um, opportunities to, to consider for, for making recommendations, but then there are other places in the law where it says, but this will happen. And so I'm just curious if we have that starting point, <laughs> that box. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I've started to for looking, reviewing kind of Act 164, um, more with the eye of what are potential limitations for us or where the what's written into the law has potential for unintended environmental consequences. Uh, so kind of taking that, I haven't done kind of a full gap analysis, uh, but I do agree, Billy, with what you're saying is we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel, I guess. What I would love to have you as a reference point for is now that cannabis is considered an industrial product, I guess, or commercial product and not agriculture, how does that, what implications are there for that and what potential um, ways do we need to encourage, uh, you know, environmental things because, you know, an industrial process is going to be different than an agricultural process as far as um, dealing with, I guess, like process or, you know, um, licensing. You know, one of the things I was looking at prior to this meeting was Vermont's kind of cottage food um, acts and how that can pertain to small farmers um, and like the oversight of those different agencies, but how potentially that could be good guidance for, for some things to encourage kind of more small farmers um, and things like that. But yeah, seeing what's already in place, what's already being used, I think is the best way to go forward for sure. Yeah, like I think there's kind of two questions, right? There's this is the cultivation of cannabis is kind of traditionally an agricultural activity that's now being treated in a different way in the regulatory space. So what kind of updates, changes, you know, questions need to be answered to facilitate that transition? Like, you know, are, are there going to be new issues that arise because of that that we haven't anticipated? And can we absorb them into the existing kind of regulatory frameworks or not? And if not, like, what do we need to do to get ahead of it. The second question I think is, what's the board's goal around kind of the type and mix of cultivators and processors and how can and should the kind of environmental and regulatory frameworks facilitate that outcome? And I think they're kind of separate questions. Um, so, and they're both good ones, but I, I think that's how I'm, I'm looking at it. Like, I'm not clear what the board is trying to accomplish as far as like, indoor outdoor scale mix so i think as we learn more about that we can talk about how to kind of support and incentivize that through you know environmental re review and regulation but it seems like the first question might be you know where are the kind of the gaps i know stephanie and i have had a couple conversations around like you know things that have been traditionally agricultural haven't been regulated for like stormwater and things of that nature necessarily you know how are we going to deal with hemp cultivation or should make cannabis cultivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you wouldn't mind, what are your biggest concerns right now? Like what you're seeing um, from you know traditional agriculture and potentially having this new industry with either farms expanding, incorporating you know, existing farms, um, getting into this industry, or new farmers. I think it's probably more of the environmental concerns would be for new farmers who maybe not have the agricultural background coming into the industry, um, but. Sure. I think, just generally speaking, and um, you know, it's kind of the use of water for irrigation. I think that's a manageable piece. It's not a it's not a significant concern, but just trying to understand kind of the cumulative impact, the kind of uh, consumption from any given operation at different scales. Like just trying to understand, uh, you know, water consumption for irrigation and what that looks like, and make sure it's within some kind of reasonable sideboards. Um, and if not, you know, then we can just figure out how, how we need to respond. And then uh, the kind of management of organic waste post-harvest, um, post-processing, um, to make sure that, you know, to the extent possible, we can try to uh, dispose of those outside of landfills. I think landfills may be an option, but to the extent that they can be composted or, or used otherwise, uh, you know, I think there's an opportunity there. Um, and then, just this kind of interstitial space between ag and commercial, if a farmer who has a, an agricultural operation also wants to grow cannabis, which is not an agricultural crop, you know, how do we bridge those things? It's on the same piece of property, it's the same equipment, you know, maybe the same approach to irrigation, waste management, like just understanding how, what opportunities may exist to provide some flexibility, notwithstanding the law calling this a uh, commercial activity. I agree no, I with that as well, um, that, you know, just good agricultural management practices necessitate the rotation of crops. And if we're 
putting cannabis in one field one year or every three years and switching it to another place, how does that get addressed um, with that intersection between farming and, and, uh, and a commercial non-ag commodity? <laughs> Uh, and, and maybe we should use the same we should use the same laws that apply in farming to, to these operations, um, and, and they shouldn't be treated differently. <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree, um, and that actually leads me kind of to a few questions um, that I had, which was kind of you know to ensure sustainability is kind of valued alongside I would say the public health and legal compliance because that's what we're seeing you know, across the board with every state is, it's always kind of an afterthought. It's the public health, the legal compliance that take precedence um, is, you know, making sure that, you know, kind of the attention, the, the compliance, there's expertise, all of that in there. So I did want to see is, um, and if um, you guys know kind of who will be enforcing these regulations, like who has jurisdiction over, uh, the cultivation and manufacturing side of the, the recreational market, has that been determined? It, it, it hasn't yet, Jacob, and that's that's tasked to a couple other subcommittees uh, okay. about the mechanism, um, so that, that's still being worked through as well. Okay, perfect. Just to make sure I didn't uh, not find that. And so yeah, I guess like just some questions or things to, to think about is, yeah, uh, who will be enforcing these regulations? How will the recommendations and the regulations, will they be enforced with agent capacity, expertise available, the compliance process? Um, you know, one thing we've seen a lot of is, you're talking about like, you know, an energy demand consumption limitation. You know, are there actually auditors available? Are they trained to be able to do this? You know, um, looking at kind of how, you know, food safety uh, has oversight. Um, and then specifically, I think, which is beneficial for the licensees and ultimate business owners is how will the regulations um, be understood, um, you know, the clarity of them, and then how applicants actually reach or exceed compliance with these regulations. Um, and so I think if we're, you know, this is a new industry, even if they're, you know, already agricultural um, business owners or industrial business owners, you know, knowing that you know, how they're actually going to be oversight or how the application process is going to work is going to be super important. I kind of deem it the customer service aspect um, to make sure that on every level, sustainability is is valued and not just, you know, an afterthought or, or you know, usually an oversight on some level. So moving forward um, to kind of better or... Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that just, um, I'm, I don't want to get too far off topic into issues with, with the other subcommittees, but uh, it is explicitly in the act that uh, the board is, is encouraged to utilize uh, strategic partnerships with, with the other agencies. Um, so just out of curiosity, Stephanie, how, would, how is the enforcement handled with, with hemp? Are, are you partnering with, it, with another state agency or, or do you and all kind of compliance enforcement appeals within your department? Yeah, so we, within the hemp program, I mean, specifically the box of hemp and cultivation of hemp, it's within the program administered at the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Um, so we do the licensing, or the, what we call it a registration. We do um, the inspections, and then we handle the enforcement of those um, of act, you know, well, first we we provide compliance assistance. We don't come out with a hammer. We try to inform people of how they can comply with the regulations. Um, I think most any regulatory program, almost all regulatory programs, it's cheaper to get voluntary compliance than it is to come out with a hammer. So that's the approach we use. Um, but relative to like fire safety standards in a processing facility, that's administered by the Division of Fire Safety within the Department of um, Public Safety. So we do have relationships, but they have a clear box that they regulate, and it applies to hemp processors. Likewise, um, I'm trying to think of other, uh, <laughs> off the top of my head, other state agencies that are involved as well. But I mean, it, it all, you know, again, we just regulate hemp and all other state agencies, apply their regulations, and administer those and enforce those. I might, I might add, Tom, <coughs> Stephanie, I also know that at, at Ag, 
you know, they have a pesticide enforcement team, they have a nursery enforcement team, so they kind of work to, you know, I know Mike's out there doing a lot of hemp inspecting, but there's other, yeah. there's other arms within their enforcement division. Tom, for your reference, and I can share this with the Enforcement and Compliance Subcommittee, you know, Brent and I have had those conversations with Ag's enforcement team. I also recognize that this is not an Ag product, so maybe us, Billy, the Agency of Agriculture can come to some type of understanding if that's a direction that we want to go, depending on how certain things shake out. I've also had contact with the Department of Liquor and Lottery on how they um, enforce at the retail level, you know, with ID checks, so on and so forth. So if we can, we can, I can share that um, in my findings there. And, like, and for instance, the health department, they inspect kitchens through the food and lodging program. And then again, as you know, Kyle mentioned, pesticides, nurseries, so on and so forth, but within the agency of that. What, what I think would be really helpful is for someone to kind of like, chart out like what the different activities are that you anticipate like indoor cultivation at different scales outdoor cultivation at different scales whatever processing might be involved and like kind of matrixing out like the kind of impacts the existing regulatory oversight like gaps opportunities because i like this all depends on like what you're actually talking about right like growing cannabis in a warehouse is going to have a whole different suite of considerations than growing it in a, a field someplace. So it's just, I think, being able to speak more specifically about the activity will help these conversations. Yeah. I read, and, and uh, I, I apologize, I didn't, I wasn't trying to steer this too off topic, but um, it is important just for the overall structure and the other subcommittees. Uh, Billy, just so you know, the, the Subcommittee right after this, so in the next 28 minutes, is the market structure licensing fees subcommittee where they are breaking that all out based on the market analysis that was that was just recently done. Um, and Stephanie, yeah, it's 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 critical for us just to understand. Um, and, and you answered it, but but the big item, big ticket items like licensing and enforcement. And it sounds like your own adjudication appeals process that is all handled within your own. Uh, hemp department, notwithstanding the, the other uh, agencies that you work with. So, um, yeah, uh, that's helpful for my understanding. But again, sorry, Jacob, I didn't want to take No, it. no. Yeah, no worries. I was just going to say is I can uh, create some slides on what how we see kind of the processes of, you know, indoor, outdoor, greenhouse, small, large, and then how different states have kind of tasked it with different agencies. I'm thinking specifically with like California has had so many different agencies overseeing it and it was such a mess to be completely honest that they actually just, I just got an email about it yesterday that they have now put it all under one roof so that there's not a different agency overseeing the cultivation, the processing, the distribution, the retail, the manufacturing, all of that um, to, to allow for I mean, A lot of it had to do with, you know, taxing and uh, tax incentives or just tax burden and, and the way the market is just really struggling so i can definitely create some matrices provide some information um for that for monday's meeting yeah just like the reality in vermont is that you know i think most regulatory agencies do their own enforcement right so like my agency issues a bunch of permits and we have our own enforcement division for those permits stephanie agency regulates their stuff, they enforce their stuff, fire safety, public safety, so it's all, I think it is this kind of distributed model that sounds like maybe the case in California. Um, it's very unlikely that, I, I, you know, I don't want to get ahead of it, but I can't imagine that being consolidated into one thing at this time, because we have to duplicate a whole like regulatory framework for just one sector, so that just, like California, it's a totally different scale, different quality, so, but I guess that's, you know, too deep yeah but i can definitely break it down into what departments are usually overseeing these um and at least issues we're seeing with that or um how it'll be able because there's also the state licensing county licensing issues you know we see a lot of just even how cultivation space has been interpreted um you know is flowering canopy based off of said square footage like a raised bed or is it flowering you know plant drip line and so that's caused a lot of issues i think there's always paying attention to with recommendations how it be interpreted on the MAC kind of state level, but then also with like zoning issues and making sure everyone's kind of on the same page. Um, and, and, you know, because I think that just helps with an easier rollout and also oversight on all levels. So 
Um, as far as kind of dividing these into, we're kind of on that overview of sustainability scope. Um, I wanted to kind of see your guys' opinion on breaking this into kind of manageable sections based on topic. So in the agenda, I had kind of energy, carbon, water, waste. Um, after thinking about it, I also wanted to add kind of ecosystem management or land management, which would include things as like ecosystem services, biodiversity, wildlife habitat improvement, conservation, erosion control, soil building, that kind of stuff. And then as well as a social equity component, which would be uh, BIPOC community members or any marginalized community members, kind of war on drugs or previously incarcerated um, individuals, economically disadvantaged, and kind of the small farmer, craft farmer um, cohort. Uh, but I wanted to see if you guys had any other uh, kind of Vermont specific categories or something that should be broken out into uh, different categories or, or, or whatnot, just so I have a better understanding as I start to um, map out our schedule. Um, I think that's probably the best way of doing it is these kind of specific topic meetings. I think that makes sense. I guess I, I'm curious as to whether all these are kind of germane to this subcommittee. I feel like there's other groups that maybe, you know, I think like there's someone who has energy expertise on the advisory panel that's not in the subcommittee, so it seems like those topics should go wherever that person is, but I, I could be wrong on that. There's, I don't believe there's anybody from the advisory committee specifically with that energy expertise. Okay, so you just have the Department of Public Service in? They're not on the subcommittee. They're, they, they, I think they were charged with drafting recommendations for us to consider from an energy perspective, but they don't have a set role on the advisory committee. Okay, thank you. Yep. I would say, Jacob, from the board's perspective, the board is, and, and this is for Billy and Jacob well, and Stephanie and, and everybody, we're very interested to see how the commercial designation triggers or does not trigger Act 250, Billy, from a small scale perspective, from a large scale perspective, outside. So overarching, in addition to the, bu the buckets Jacob has mentioned, how land use planning in the state of Vermont will be impacted by this regulated market um, we just want to make sure we're on the front end of 250 if that's going to be a, a consideration that, that we've got to work through moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, Jacob, you know, or, um, yeah, we, we've, we've, I've initiated that conversation with the Natural Resources Board that administers the Act 250 program. Um, and I think you've, the, 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 the board has at least heard from, um, some of their staff with some general comments, but I think yeah, that's that's a that's a question that needs to be answered, and they are the one who answers it, right? They control their own jurisdiction, so I think we're going to need to um, interact directly with the Natural Resources Board to figure out, you know, how and if Act 250 will apply in those settings. Well, maybe I'm I'm just throwing ideas out here, and, and I don't want to derail everything. So I'm just sitting here. It might be great to bring them to one of these subcommittee meetings over the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, I don't know who should be the person to reach out. Bryn, we can reach out, or Billy, if you have that relationship. Um, but I feel like that's a, the top of the slope, and we're going to roll downhill depending on how this is impacted by 250. Yeah, because that, you know, there's like the, there's like the, the baseline environmental regulations around water quality, air quality, et cetera, that my agency administers, but then there's like a higher level of review and scrutiny if projects are subject to Act 250. Right. And that really is unique. So I think that is a critical path question. And, um, you know, I would encourage the, your staff um, to reach out to them and invite them formally to come to one of these meetings. Um, I just think that would have more oomph than me kind of reaching out to them and, and doing it. I'm, I'm happy to do it, but I, I do feel like if, if the, the board was to reach out to them and invite them in and provide some context, it would probably be a more appropriate way. Great. And in the meantime, Billy, if you do have any like primers or, or you know, overviews of 250 that you could forward to Jacob, I mean, I can ask the same with the Natural Resources Board, but I don't know how familiar Jacob is with 250 and why it's, it's a, a large starting point for us. I want to make sure everybody understands. Yeah, well, I know Aaron provided a kind of PowerPoint to you at a previous meeting, so you know that's probably a good primer. But I'm happy, Jacob, to just talk to you now or at another point to kind of give you a, a deeper context for the law and kind of how it 
they comply here? How will they comply here? Yeah, I, I've read the, I believe it was the one that was posted um, that they did during a meeting. Um, so I saw like that primer, um, but I have a very, I would say, cursory knowledge of it at this point. Um, one of the things I definitely want to do before the meeting is definitely invite additional experts um, into each one of these meetings as needed. Um, but one of the things I'm planning on doing is with the VS um, kind of marketing tool with the estimates that they've created is taking that um, and looking at from their estimated figures, um, what does that actually look like as far as energy consumption, carbon emissions, water usage, effluent discharge, waste, things like that. So we can have kind of an in-depth conversation. So I think you know most of these energy water uh, sorry, energy, carbon, and water will probably be like two meetings. So potentially for us to discuss all of that, have the gap analysis, and then bring in um, you know someone from the Natural Resources Board for the second meeting, so we really understand where, where we're going with it, and then can have a um, you know a detailed conversation with them. It's kind of how I'm seeing this play out. Um, so then I want to move along to so our this hour is quickly coming to a close, and so. Some of these things stuff that you had brought up earlier, I kind of had kind of put into this as like potential limitations. Um, so, so things that I've been seeing, um, and I talked to Andrew Livingston, who's part of Vincente Sederberg, who created the the model, because uh, we worked together on a few projects in the past on just how we're seeing kind of the environmental or sustainability, you know, what I would call like issues or, or, or limitations of what's written into into the act right now. And I would say like. You know, the ideal sustainable grow is definitely a kind of an outdoor hoop house. Um, there you are getting maybe one, maybe three harvests a year. And the concern of really incentivizing or pushing for all outdoor cultivation, you know, is the overproduction that you see, the seasonality, um, and then the inevitable price swings in the fall and winter. Uh, you can look at kind of Oregon for, I mean, Last I checked, it's been a minute, but they had a million pounds in metric, you know, continually for three years. And it's just not an economically sustainable situation. Um, you know, California every year faces, you know, a price swing of, you know, could be $1,000 to $1,200 a pound, you know, for outdoor, everyone's harvesting in fall, winter, that drops on a, you know, 400, 600. And so it's, you know, those things definitely need to be considered as um, you know we look at what this regu what these regulations or recommendations are encouraging because um, there's definitely a balance between environmental sustainability and economic sustainability. Um, I think some ways of going about that is looking at square footage caps. Um, if people are really concerned about multi-state operators coming in, you know, if you limit the size of cultivation space, then that's not really an issue. No one's going to invest, you know, millions of dollars. They can only have five, ten thousand, you know, twenty thousand square feet of cultivation space. So, those are some things that I've noticed. Um, one thing that I'm wondering about is the flexibility. You know, as you mentioned, Stephanie, is with the product THC limits. So, what I've seen is that there's a fifty milligram per package um, limit, which is essentially doubling. The packaging waste that we see from all other states. Most states have set that limit at 100. So you're looking at, you know, just generically doubling the amount of, of packaging that's going to be in the marketplace. Um, and then the 60% THC limit in concentrates. I think there's some concerns there on it will limit kind of the overflow or the overproduction of flour that's going to enter the market. Um, most of that goes into distillate. Distillate usually exceeds 60%, so you're just kind of creating a potential bottleneck for the storage or self-stability of any, you know, overproduction that you're going to see in the market. And so I think there's definitely some concerns there from an environmental perspective on the amount of waste that's being generated, but then also what are farmers going to be doing with their final product and how is that going to, to kind of influence market dynamics. Um, usually you see if things are on the shelf for, or stored for over a year, it then goes into the concentrate market to at least get another year or two out of it. And if you're at a 6% concentrate, then where's all that space for everything going to be going? How is that all, you know, going to be, uh, you know, impacted as well as, you know, the amount of concentrates that are then going to be created with the, 
material that's that's being grown. Um, and then, yeah, so I guess any comments or or questions or anything on those two points? I have something, but Stephanie, feel free to go first. Well, no, I was just thinking that the limitations are set in the law, as I understand it, and in order to change that, there, you know, I mean, potentially there could be a recommendation <laughs> down the road, but it's not going to be immediate. Um, so it's it's a concern I, I, I get, but maybe not an immediate concern, because it's going to require some legwork on behalf of the Cannabis Control Board to get a change and then also to think about what recommendation what in addition to the recommendation related to sustainability for too much packaging and waste and so on and so forth as you described um, what can the cannabis control board recommend that alleviates the concerns that are uh, occurred when this the percentage concentrate 60 percent and the milligram per package was set I mean obviously there was a concern there so how do I identify that and move that forward but again doesn't seem super immediate immediate um, related you know but otherwise the intersection of regulation as it exists in Vermont seems something to unpack <laughs> yeah and I was just gonna say you know that whole conversation you know I, I would really encourage you to look at the Vermont market because I think it's vastly different than the western states that you may have worked in in the past I think it's predominantly flower based I think it's predominantly in, indoor cultivated traditionally you know, we've got short growing seasons, you know, there's a lot of indoor cultivation on the black market. And I think that's where the demand is. And, you know, that may shift over time, but I, I think, you know, just kind of based on anecdotal experience, I think that's kind of what our market is. And it's, it's distinct from the West where there's a lot more outdoor cultivation, right? There's more land, it's a better season, people know how to grow outdoors. Here, it's different. So. I would just test those assumptions before building anything based on them. And kind of to the extent there's markets, research that's been done in Vermont, that might help inform. Um. No, definitely. Um, I mean, we also, uh, we work across uh, all of North America. So we are, we have like a decent presence in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, uh, Maine, New York, uh, starting to get into New Jersey, Maryland. So kind of all over the place. Um, I would uh, say- Those places are Vermont though. 100%, we're, we're, uh, 100%. Special place. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. And this needs to be Vermont specific, so I do uh, take all of your considerations and perspective, um, you know, better, more more than mine. Um, but I will say, it's, as you've seen kind of legal markets, you do start to see more of the baby boomers, more of the soccer moms, um, you know, now that it's been state kind of um, accepted, dabbling into it and that's where kind of you see edibles um usually overtaking or at least growing um pretty you know exponentially over flower you know most elderly seniors don't want to smoke um yeah, no, so that's, that's a good point so i, I get you so yeah you, yeah and also just i think from convenience as we start to see concentrates um you know it is going to depend on kind of what the fda comes out with i think today or this week as far as vapes and uh, the nicotine aspect of it and how that translates into cannabis vape cartridges and stuff but i think there's definitely that's the biggest market you see of growth once you get um a recreational market um but yeah i think flour is definitely the predominant um product um, you'll see I, have, it I was just saying I was having a, I have a question and I, I don't know the answer to it but whether or not um, again because we're Vermont what percentage of individuals are taking advantage of the personal cultivation um, of you know two mature and four mature plants or whether or not they're exploiting that and growing their own and how that's impacted any kind of market projections um, you know a can-do society like Vermont <laughs> Who likes to grow things? I mean, we, you know, generally um, people do. <laughs> there are people who like to shop for things too, for food and whatnot. But I'm just curious if there was any information about that. Such a hard data point yeah. to gather. I know. We, we've got some <laughs> anecdotal info from like the Vermont Growers Association. Okay. Um, but it's hard to gather that that data yeah. on who's actually taking advantage of the personal use. The personal use. Yeah. Um, and who's exploiting the personal use and doing more, more than, than they should. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, that's a good question. And, and Billy, we've heard a lot about outdoor growing. Like, a lot of folks are very interested in it. So uh, it's hard to assume anything, I think, right now. But um, 
to get back to your, your second question that you posed, I think once we see more of a market structure and how we're going to tier this thing out, I think it's going to inform a lot of other committees work because we'll be able to work from a from a starting point and you know those decisions we haven't gotten there yet um, but you know I've been a proponent of an indoor license or an outdoor license and tearing it from there if, if that's the direction we go again remains to be seen but recognizing that, that the environmental and energy impacts are different depending on your tier your size and your indoor versus outdoor right and again, that's the next subcommittee starting in nine minutes. So I want to reserve some time, uh, Jacob, for, for public comments or questions uh, for anyone in the room. I think we're good. All right. So I just had one last kind of question um, or thought, which was sustainability incentives and encouraging you know we're, the regulations will obviously set or already have um, environmental um, regulations in place so for reaching compliance with that or really going above and beyond which i think a lot of small farmers in vermont will be doing or are already doing um the incentive programs that are in place right now dealing with kind of energy water waste management are those state or federally incentivized or managed What was the question again? Is it for me? I think it's for <laughs> Billy. I can try and translate, Jacob. Um, so for Billy and Stephanie, with the respect that there is incentive programs built into your respective agencies, how you okay. handle right. regulatory systems, are those managed at the state level or part of a broader federal partnership? I think Jacob's wondering because if they're federal incentives, it might make it harder for this program to take advantage of various incentives that your agencies offer. Yeah. I, um, I'm sure there are federal incentives. I actually have no idea if there are federal incentives offered through the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. Um, there are certainly grant programs that apply to the hemp um, community industry in the state of Vermont, um, which have limitations on them currently, but I won't go into that. Um, there are grant programs at the Agency of Agriculture um, that are state funded, that aren't federal funded. Uh, the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative is state funded. I think there might be some State funded trade, well, that's not going to work. Um, trade shows aren't going to happen. Never mind. Uh, trying to think of other potential state um, incentives. Yeah, the big one at AG, I thought it was working lands. It was working lands, which yeah. That would require a conversation with working lands to try and get this. Yeah. I think they're even, that would crack the door on hemp even being a part of that program. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm not sure. Um, the other thing that I was thinking is that farmland conservation, I think there are state funds that can be spent on that. Um, that aren't, but there is, there are federal funds as well, but there are state specific funds, but which would make that land eligible for cultivation if it's state funded rather than federal funded. Um, and then that's what I have. If I can think of anything else, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that we have like a ton of incentives that would be applicable here, or like regulatory incentives. You know, we have access to infrastructure funding through the state revolving loan fund for kind of water wastewater infrastructure that typically flows to municipalities uh, that is federally based you know we've got lots of small pots of money that we put out to folks for conservation practices but i i'm not familiar enough with those to think of any that might be applicable here but typically they're kind of passed through money from the epa that we get um, but there there are also pots of state funds that we use uh, for, for a number of different things and often they're commingled so like there may be opportunities to use just state funds for certain applications under an existing program but um, I can't think of anything that would be directly applicable here but I, I'm happy to give that some more thought. And I can reach out to Energy Vermont because um, that's also um, usually big things with the energy and the rebates and the incentive, the incentive programs there. If they're going to do like strategic energy management audits, um, things like that. A lot of that comes from federal funding. Um, and so just with the 280E issue, um, it's, yeah, just making sure that as you think about these things. Um, there's, there is quite a bit of state funds that go into the efficiency utilities in Vermont, though. There's uh, surcharges on electric bills and things like that. So there, there is a pretty significant amount of state funding that goes to like efficiency Vermont and those sorts of enterprises. So there, there may be opportunities for state programs. There. Yeah, I was going to mention efficiency Vermont. 
you know, one of their hallmarks, or they hold themselves out to the community as, you know, if you, we'll help you if you go above and beyond the regulatory floor. So, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm thinking through this conversation, I think Jacob's wary of going too high from an environmental sustainability floor just so folks can still take advantage of certain yeah. efficiency programs that might be available to them. I want to say that there was suggest a suggestion made and I think it was a member of the public that maybe the energy when Lauren Merlino and TJ Poor um, and the other gentleman presented where they're, you know, similar to the um, surcharge on energy bills to fund Efficiency Vermont, whether there was a suggestion to do some kind of a surcharge or charge on at scale indoor grows that would be put into a pot to assist others, you know, um, stand up a business. And so, but. That would require a lot of work. But I just remember hearing that and I was like, oh, that was kind of interesting. So I just was going to mention it again. <laughs> yeah, Lauren Marlino is leaving and moving to Oregon, which is a big bummer because she's yes. not knowledgeable. Of she has a replacement case. and I have the okay. replacement's I'd, name. I'd love so to get I can get it for you. Yes. <laughs> and if that's, um, so just to address that, so. Um, the main program I know that does that is Boulder. So Boulder has an energy impact offset fund, which is a 2.16 kilowatt hour, uh, 2.16 cents per kilowatt hour charge that goes into um, kind of an energy efficiency steering committee um, to essentially help to offset um, or improve energy efficiency measures. Um, so it's definitely something that's already been created. Um, the success of the program, I think from uh, there's a Boulder County program and a Boulder City program. Um, my understanding and talks to the administrators from the Boulder City level is that it hasn't really translated to energy efficiency outcomes, um, but they do use the funds to install kind of smart meters and uh, energy monitoring, and they pay for um, the kind of ASHRAE level one and two um, energy audits, trying to develop the baseline and give the cultivators, you know, as much information and strategic guidance to to um, you know, improve their new efficiency. So I think it's definitely a possibility. <clears throat> and I think part of that also stemmed from just the way I think utilities um, here initially had tried to treat the cannabis space um, as well uh, and not necessarily treating them as, you know, ordinary business owners. Um, so I think in Vermont that'll be different. Um, but definitely uh, been tried before and, and, and could be explored. Yeah. Um, okay, so then with that, I guess we can adjourn this meeting early. Um, I will um, work on doing a bit more of uh, gap analysis on so the Act 164. Um, Billy, I'll probably be in touch with you, um, even though I guess our next meeting is Monday, so we only have one, one day, um, but maybe well, we that, That's a meeting. question. I don't have anything on my calendar other than this meeting, so um, I, I don't, I, I need to understand kind of what the plan is going forward. Oh, okay. My understanding um, is that we were scheduled to be meeting Mondays and Thursdays for an hour at this time, um, so that would be 2 p.m., no, that's wrong, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Um, Eastern time on Mondays and Thursdays. That's correct. Yeah, the, the one and only request I made of your colleagues when we had our initial meet and greet was that people put meeting invitations on my calendar um, as early as possible. So um, if, if someone could please send invitations out for those future meetings, because I, I don't have anything and, and my calendar books up solid quickly. So. If you want me there, I'm going to need some calendar. Absolutely. And sorry for that. I can get Nelly to help with that. Okay. Okay. Jacob, I'll take your motion to adjourn. I'll, I'll second it. And then um, we will get the minutes out and we'll be back here Monday at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.